I'm known as a serial entrepreneur, so I'm going to get up on stage and then so everyone can see me. <laughs> so I, I think possibly I'm one of the few non-medical speakers today. And in 2002, when I started my first, uh, when, when we started the first hospital ships in Bangladesh, I had never been inside a hospital in my life. And I wanted to take this ship and go to areas where people had never even seen a doctor in their life. And over the years, we've built a healthcare system in Bangladesh, and not only that, we have worked with communities, not projects. So when you see that a country like Bangladesh, you know, it's one fourth the size of France, 180 million people, and 30-40% uh, under the water all the time, a lot like Holland, I can tell you. So yesterday as I was landing in, in, uh, by plane into Amsterdam, you know, I saw what looked exactly like our working area. <laughs> you know, the chores. There was water, there was land going under the water, and I said, wow, you know. So this is where we are alike, we are very similar. We have the same problems. When you work in the poorest of the poor, you know, one of the poorest countries in the world, and in that poorest of the countries in the world, you are working in areas where there is no intervention. In 2002, I remember Dr. Henk from Netherlands coming and, and people touching his skin to see whether the white is really white, you know? And uh, so in, in that area, you can't only do healthcare because healthcare is a component. And as I say, it's the primary component because when you're suffering, no other development intervention is possible. You know, you, if you have a headache, you want your paracetamol first before anything else. When you're suffering, you want to get cured first. And hence, Friendship started what we call a holistic model for community development so that those people who are earning $1 a day or even less in communities where you eat perhaps one meal or two meals a day and you really have no opportunity, no dignity, no hope to ensure that those people in the next 10 years or 15 years can reach the mainstream of, of, of the economy you know, when, where they can perhaps be, they can perhaps have control on their lives and, what they, and their future. So we started a holistic model where we do healthcare. And these are areas where you have, as I said, you know, we are the most, one of the most climate impacted countries in the world. So every year we are sitting in floods. I mean, uh, the areas we work with, the coastal belt and the riverine areas of Bangladesh, uh, People are living on top of the roofs of the houses, sometimes for one week, sometimes for a month. And from there, they try to survive. So you need to do uh, relief work, you need to do adaptation solutions, you need to do uh, uh, train them for uh, disaster management. And in that we include water, sanitation, rehabilitation, relief work, all that is done. After that, they need access to finance and they need training so that when they migrate, this is a con constantly migrating community. And uh, in Bangladesh, over 10,000 people migrate every day within the, within the country. And we are ha these are migratory communities, so we need to ensure that they have access to finance, training, so that they can stand on their feet. After that, they need, to be, they need hope, and hope is really education. So Friendship has built schools and secondary schools and adult education systems. And then we link them up with the mainstream government structures because someday if we are not there, then they need to still be able to know where they stand in their ecosystem, in the political, socio-economic ecosystem of the country. So we link them up to the mainstream government, train them to do that. And we also do some cultural preservation because I think that brings a lot of identity to the people. So going back to the Friendship healthcare system, what we discovered was there were just no doctors. You know, we have um, three, uh, three doctors for 10,000 people, MBBS doctors. We have 0 0.3 surgeons for 10,000 people, one nurse for 10,000 people, and out of this, 80% is all in the cities and towns. And Bangladesh, in the areas we work in, we have more than 10, 20, 40 million people actually you know, the coastal belt and riverine areas. So you can understand the situation of healthcare in these areas. So I started, I, I took it on very practically. 
How do we reach everyone? How do we give care to as many people as we can? Where do we say, no, we can't do more than this? So all these were not only ethical questions, but they were practical questions. They were questions of the heart. They were questions of the mind. They were questions of what we can do and what we can't do, our abilities. And so we picked up the healthcare system and we put it through a filter. What we did was we call it the tier three, which is the community. We worked with the community people so that they could do, do certain level of primary care because we found that 80%, 90% of the people were just basically suffering from primary health care. Then we went to the next level. What they couldn't do would go up to the secondary tier, which was the satellite clinics manned by paramedics or uh, medical assistants. And what they couldn't do, that went to the doctors. So we, the three tier are the ship hospitals, which is doing up to secondary level services including medical services, I'll come to that later again. So the second tier takes care of all the follow-ups. So around each hospital ship, we have between 100 to 200 mobile clinics which are moving around. Uh, they are, uh, every month they come to the, to the areas where the medical surgeries have been done and then they follow up the patients, they do prevention, they do from cervical cancer, like uh, we had uh, last three years, 85,000 screening, screening only for cervical cancer and see and treat, which was done by, with the doctor in Holland. And um, then uh, EPI follow-ups of all the patients coming onto the ships. And then we uh, work with uh, the community Medicaid who does the follow-up. And we link the whole system up through a uh, in-house built mobile, um, uh, mobile, uh, not, not an app, but really a mobile, uh, <laughs> it's a mobile system where we do follow-ups, we do referrals, we do direct uh, services. For example, if you come with a stomach ache, then they will tell you where to go, or if they, if they can intervene, they will intervene, otherwise it's referred to somewhere, or our medical center in Dhaka takes care of it. So it's a mobile solution that we found, it's a software that we've built, and it links up all the system, including with the, with the, with the government system. And uh, so I will, I will show you a little program on what we are doing, and so that you understand the area, and then I'll move on to how we work.
and I have to tell you uh, statistics which uh, may interest you because you were hearing so much about what is the impact. So any, but let me tell you, before, uh, when I would appeal to doctors, because we had the ship, we had the whole healthcare system, but we needed the cream on the cake. The, and the cream on the cake was the foreign doctors who would come. And the local specialists also who come, but also the foreign doctors, because they would bring in something very special. So often, I would, I would hear from the doctors, local and international, okay, we go in, we operate, the story that, of course, Interplus said also today, we go, we operate, then what? Who does the follow-ups? But the responsibility of the follow-ups, we feel, is for friendship, is really friendships. Because you are providing what is your speciality, it's our responsibility to do what is our speciality, that is, do the follow-ups, ensure that the people of the country that we've invited you to come, and they are taken care of. So we really try our best to do that. And till now, we haven't had any foreign doctors running away. <laughs> we have had them, they, have, they are coming over the last 18 years, some of them. And uh, when I went, so in these areas, of course, it's so difficult to keep doctors, as you can understand. I mean, I mean this is an overall problem everywhere. So I'm just giving you an example. So it's so difficult to keep a doctor you know, a uh, local doctor, local surgeon, very expensive, we couldn't afford it. So we, so when I remember, when I, I remember when I first went and I asked a local doctor, that dentist, that can you please train our dental technician to perform some sort of operations, you know, at least a root canal, up to the root canal level. He said, impossible. And it was Dutch doctors who said, no, we will make sure he can do it. And today, all our ships, all our hospitals have got medical assistants, doc, uh, dental assistants, who are now performing these, uh, these kind of uh, work. For Shaheen, who came to me when, came to Friendship when he was like 18 years old, and he had just finished his schooling, and he started becoming, a, like practicing for an OT nurse. Today, he's got an MPH and uh, he's still with us, and he does all kinds of simple operations like a lipoma, cyst, doing, doing some sew, you know, sewing up some wounds, etc. So people can be taught. We really are underestimate what they can, so what they can do. And I, 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 ha I have great hopes that with the new technology for tomorrow, we, can, we have to see at which level who can be trained to optimize and have the maximum impact and maximum reach. Of course, to be a credible organization, you need to ensure it follows the government and the WHO protocols. I mean, we cannot step out of that because that would really, uh, then, then it doesn't become credible. But within that structure, we can really do a lot. And I think it is for this that we need the technologies we've heard of today we need to use them. We need to pick, select, and use them. We cannot use everything because these are made for those who are already in, you know, in, in this world, already in the world of having getting medical services or access to medical services in areas where, sister, you have said, in areas where you have the reach of mobile technology, but in areas you don't. So we need to pick and choose. Technology needs to be used as a tool not as the end. And we have to be careful of that when we use it in these areas. I, I know that we are in a hurry and I don't want to move on, uh, go on, but you know, we need, well, before, I, I just want to, uh, regarding impact again, I want to come back to that, that we, when we are having, uh, we, usually the doctors or the medical teams which are coming to our ships, we know this about a year ahead. And we do our plan of the ship, the movements, the work, according to those medical teams coming in. So we do all the screenings. We've got VSATs, so we can actually have some doctor uh, a patient consultations also beforehand if needed. And we screen the patients, we keep the patients so that the doctors can come so they have this 14-hour journey. They sleep for like three hours. Dr. Shurenga is here. He can <laughs> witness that. And immediately they're put to work. So they work throughout the seven days or 10 days, and they go. And what they have left behind is incredible. 
because everyone here knows, because every, so many of you are surgeons, so many of you are doctors, that you don't have to measure the impact of a child who can't walk and can run now. You, don't, you cannot measure the impact of a woman who, since the, was married off at the age of 12, has three children by the age of 18, and has a prolapsed, and, pro prolapsed uterus, or has a fistula, and totally ostracized from society. Husband will not take her, parents will not take her, and that half an hour operation, 15 minutes operation, you don't have to measure the impact. You know, we are so involved so often with globalization and big things. I mean, we do touch lives. We touch about with 500,000 services every month. We do touch lives. But if we are lost in what can be globally done and we forget the little impacts which we create, then for me, that for me, every day that I see this little child or that little wo or that woman who is taken back into her family, the burn conjectures that we've had, who had to have six operations, no, four operations, this woman, and today has joined the friendship force by being an FCM, Community Medicaid of Friendship. You know, these are the impacts that we have. Impacts, how can we measure impacts on paper? We can impact measure with the lives that we are touching, with the changes that we are making. Because one change is a change of a community, change of a family. And that is how I measure the importance of having surgical intervention in these hard to reach areas. Thank you.